This podcast provides a platform to discuss important questions and complex issues, challenge the status quo, and confront the boundaries of the establishment. I'm retired police chief Daniel Hahn. I went from being arrested at 16 to serving over 34 years in law enforcement. My goal is to keep you informed with news not being reported, voices not being heard, and the untold history of how we got here so that we can create a way forward. Today, I'd like to welcome Ken Oliver to A Way Forward. Uh, A little background on Ken is he's the vice president of Checker.org and the executive director of the Checker Foundation, whose mission is to build a fair future of work, one job at a time, by redefining the narrative around 80 million Americans who suffer from an arrest and conviction history. Ken's work focuses on record clearance, talent development, through reskilling and upskilling programs, diversity, equity, and inclusion practices, change man- management, and public policy. Ken's own journey started in 1996 when he was sentenced to 52 years to life in prison under California's three strikes law for joyriding as a passenger in a stolen car. Ken spent 24 years in prison, eight of them in solitary confine- confinement for reading a book written by a former member of the Black Panther Party. So I'm gonna leave it at that because I want you to be able to talk about a little bit of your background, but welcome to A Way Forward, Ken. I appreciate you, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So maybe I always like to provide listeners a little bit of context. So maybe share kind of where you grew up, uh, some of the circumstances in growing up and how you initially got involved in the criminal justice system and obviously ultimately getting to the point where you were sentenced to several decades in prison. Sure. Yeah, sure. It's it's, it's a great question. I mean, my story is probably not unlike anyone that you've seen or heard or encountered in your own life and career. Cliche for, you know, a black man growing up in South LA, a young black guy who was at a young age was called by the streets to, you know, do some stuff out there. And, and mm-hmm. um, that's where I found love. That's where I found my homies. That's why I found meaning for myself as a, as someone who came from a broken home and, and didn't have the best guidance um, on what I should be doing. So I rebelled against a lot of stuff and then found myself quickly, um, about 14 and a half years old, I think turning 15, I was sentenced to my first bid in youth authority, California youth authority, back when they used to have California youth authority. Right. So, so, you know, I was a, a, a rebel rouser and a, and a troublemaker uh, at a young age and spent from 14 and a half to probably 23, 24 years old in and out of incarceration, you know, looking for direction, never really held a job, running the streets, getting involved with stuff. And then um, when I was 24, I got out of prison, you know, back, back then they didn't give a lot of time out. It was like 16 month jolts, two year jolts, that type of thing. And uh, got out and stayed out for you know about five and a half years, and then one of my one of my friends in Inglewood, his family owned a car shop, and you know I had kind of turned my life around, got married, had kids, and kind of went a different direction. And you know my friend wanted me to escort him to a few places to make a few pickups, you know, and it was just some quick money. And you know I I found myself a passenger in a stolen car. Uh, escorting him over to his father's uh, garage garage shop where they used to chop cars up and chop VIN numbers and stuff. Right. Sell them overseas. And uh, little did I know, because I hadn't, I wasn't paying attention to the law. And at the time I wasn't really in trouble in the mid nineties that this right. thing had passed called three strikes law. Yep. And so, you know, when they pulled us over, I figured, you know, it'd be a weekend in the substation, you know, it was a joyride offense. It was, you know, a misdemeanor type of deal, or used, at least it used to be. And they told me my bail was $600,000. And I said, $600,000 for what? And they, say, they said, well, you, you know, you're a three strike candidate, you have a record. And as a result, you know, you're looking at life in prison. And so I spent the better part of a year in the county jail, wondering if I was gonna spend the rest of my life in prison. And, and the judge in my case, he gave me life in prison. He gave me 52 years of life in prison. And you know, it was, it was a shock to me at the time. I, I didn't, 
I didn't believe in my mind that I could do life in prison for something that when I was in a car. Yeah. It, it, it was basically the judge said, basically, this is like felony joyriding. This is like normally I give like probation for this type of stuff. But because of the three strikes law, et cetera, my hands are kind of tied. And he said, well, there's this new thing that came out called Romero. He said, but if I was to do it, I, I'll give you five minutes to take a 14 year deal. And I'm in my mid 20s at the time, you know, and so. Right. I was trying to contemplate that in five minutes, 14 years, but 14 years seemed like a long time to me. I had three young children. I'm just, you know, when you're 27, 28 years old, 42 or 43 year old, 43 year old, being 43 years old kind of seems like a long time away, you know? It feels like old. It feels like old. That's what it does. It feels like old. So I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to take a 14 year deal for being a passenger in a stolen vehicle, right? I've done a lot of stuff in my career. And uh, that was probably the, the smallest thing I'd ever right. done, right? Right, right. So anyway, make a long story short, he gave me 52 years to life in prison and, and sent me up my way. And that's how it all got started. And, and I knew that, A, I refused to accept his determination. I refused to accept that my life was meaningless and I was going to die in prison. So I showed up in prison, determined that I knew I was going to get out. I didn't know when. And I knew that if I got out, that I was going to be ready to hit the streets running. And... I just poured myself into reading books about business, politics, history, you know, philosophy, you name it, I read it, right? I read Donald Trump books, I read Warren Buffett books, I read Black history books, I read African history books, I read, you know, Shakespeare books. I just read all kinds of stuff because I knew in my mind that they had captured my body, but I knew that it, they couldn't capture my mind. And so I was, I was determined to remain free, at least mentally. So that's kind of that, that's kind of how it started. Yeah, and that the book uh, when you talk about reading books, that comes to another unique story that we talked about last time we talked. Um, you were reading a book that ultimately, which I would think, like we want folks to read books, we want them to expand their knowledge and things. But at some point, a, a certain book got you put into solitary confinement. Maybe uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So. You know, I spent the first eight or nine years of my prison experience reading, you know, um, educating myself, just trying to learn as much as I could about myself and how, from a historic standpoint, I was in this position because I wanted to better understand what my place was in history, what my place was in the world. And that's what led me down this journey of understanding my history as a black man, as descendants of slaves, about criminal justice in America. Um and to be honest with you, like I had had the book that they put me in solitary confinement for for several years. It had been sent to me through normal means through Amazon.com. My girl had sent it to me and, and there was no issue with me getting the book until I arrived at this one prison. They did a cell search and they like, why do you have all these books in here? I said, because I'm an avid, voracious reader. And they said, well, some of these books in here you ain't supposed to have. And I said, why not? I've never been told I couldn't have any of these books. Right. right. And they said, well, we consider these books dangerous. And they put me in ad seg. They, they taped up my door just like there was a murder scene, right? Taped up my cell and said, we have to do a full investigation because you have so many political books in here that you're scaring prison officials. I, I No one said I did anything. I didn't do anything other than like have these books in my cell. And I had about a hundred books at the time. And so when I was in administrative segregation, they have this team in prison called the Goon Squad or the ISU Investigative Services Unit, which, you know, goes and invests gang members and that kind of stuff. Uh, police officers are doing stuff incorrect. And they said, you know what? You, you, you've scared the warden of the prison. And mm -hmm. I said, I scared them how? And they said, they don't think you should be reading this stuff. And that, you know, they're, they're, you're making them nervous. And that we've been told to neutralize you. And wow. I said, I said, neutralize me. I said, what, what does that mean? And they're like, well, to be honest with you, Oliver, they called me by my last name. They said, if you'd have been on the yard smoking and drinking with your homies and doing all that, like no one would be messing with you. But when you start reading these political books about, you know, black power and history and politics and all that, you scare people because they think you're going to start something. Mm -hmm. And I knew then what he was saying to me was the same system, the same voice that had penalized and hung and lynched my ancestors for reading. Yep. It was the same people who wrote the laws in the South that said it's against the law for Black people to learn how to read. And I knew that what they were really afraid of is that I would wake up one day 
and believe that I was Malcolm X, George Jackson, or whoever, and and that I would realize that wait a minute, I might not, I'm not, I might not, I'm supposed to be in prison 52 right. years old, right? right? And that's that 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 thought and that understanding of history made me double down on reading. I, right, as soon as I recognized what they were doing, I said, you know, I'm not going to bow down. I said, I'm going to fight until the end of it. And so, where I directed my energy was to the law, and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to be the master at their own game. I'm going to study every constitutional case and law book that I can find that I can get my family to send. And that's what I did for about seven years while I was in solitary. And I became an expert at constitutional law, due process, amendment, first amendment, eighth amendment, sixth amendment. And I filed a lawsuit against the state of California, the California department of corrections. And they sat on my, they sat on my case for two years. And was that regarding your sentence or the solitary um, confinement? Oh, that, was or? that was regarding solitary confinement. Okay. All right. So I filed a civil rights lawsuit against them after I, you know, mastered law, read all the case law, I read thousands of cases, thousands. And I wanted to understand how a system could take a black man and put him in a prison underneath the prison for reading a the book. They had become right. the intellectual or the mental police. And they had kind of like said, if you educate yourself, you're dangerous. And that it's thought, not the first time that's happened. No, it, it's happened throughout history, right? They, they 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 kill people when you get enlightened, right? Right. When you start spreading messages, they 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 knock you down. Historically, that's that's happened throughout history. And I just started studying the law, and I filed this lawsuit. And for two years, they they didn't process my lawsuit. And then one day, a the police come to my cell and they say, "Hey, there's a judge on the video screen that wants to talk to you." Mm. And they escorted me down, you know, shackled up and took me to this room where this judge came on this video screen. And he said, do you know who I am? I said, no. He said, I'm Judge So-and-so from the Central District Federal Court. And he said, I've been sitting on your case for about two years. And he said, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Mr. Oliver, is I wanted to ask you what you wanted. And I said, well, what do you mean what do I want? And he said, well, you know, you didn't put in a lawsuit what you wanted. I said, yes, I did. I said, for an amount to be determined at trial which is my right to do. He said, oh, oh no, no, Mr. Oliver, I know. I, yeah, you have a right to do that, but I, I'm trying to get to a, something deeper. He said, I want to know what you want. And I knew when he started on this dialogue, he was basically trying to figure out how to close the books on this without it becoming public. And I said, well, you know, in, in California, the penal code says it's false imprisonment is about $160 a day. I said, I'm eight and a half years in. Mm -hmm. So we do some simple math. I said, just, just for me to answer my name or to get into a room to have a conversation, to, I think that's about 800 something thousand dollars. He's like, okay. He said, no problem. He didn't hesitate. He said, no problem. Hmm. I'm going to go talk to the attorney general. And Kamala Harris was the attorney general at the time. And he said, I'm going to go talk to the attorney general's office and I'm going to tell him exactly what you said. And I'm going to call you back in a couple of weeks and we're going to see how we can resolve this. And so by the time I got back to the cell block, I was in Soledad by this time, he, uh, they called me back. Not more than five, 10 minutes ago, by, they called me back and they had me sit in the room. They said, the judge wants to talk to you again. He told you to hold on. So about 20 minutes go by in the holding tank and they come get me again. And he said, he says, Mr. Oliver, he said, I just walked down the hallway and talked to the attorney general. And he didn't have a problem with anything you said. He said, they want to come up and talk to you. Can they come talk to you? I said, in person, the attorney general wants to come talk to me. He's like, yeah. So I knew then, you know, I'm, you know, I'm from the street, so I understand the game. That happened too quick. Yeah, yeah, it happened too quick. You want to come up, you want to come up and and, and have a briefcase and shove a ten thousand dollar check across the table, you know, because because you know as well as I do, like in prison, a lot of cats will sell out for that. That's canteen mm -hmm. money package. Absolutely. Like ten, if, if you have ten thousand dollars in prison, you you cash rich, right? And, Your horizon's and, not that far off. That's, that's right. So, you know, I ended up, you know, contacting. Uh, my attorneys on my criminal case at Stanford University and, and a corporate firm by the name of Mayor Brown. And they stepped in and took it from there and, and basically, in short, brought the state to their knees and, and made them give me some money and, and got me out of prison. That brings me to another question. You know, we see, you know, there's been movies and documentaries about, you know, whether it be a specific attorney or law firms that take on cases of people that are incarcerated. But how, how did you um, ultimately get connected to Stanford and uh, the law firm, Mayor Brown, and how did that come about? Sure, sure. So 
you know, I was on the three strikes case. And by the time, by this time, it's 2018. So Prop 36 had happened to unwind the three strikes law for people who had non-serious, non-violent crimes. But the district attorney in Los Angeles County didn't want to let me out because they I was in solitary confinement. So basically, the district attorney had said, we oppose Ken getting out of prison because he's been validated as a, as a Black guerrilla family gang member, which is how they put me in solitary. From the book. From the book. And because he's a Black guerrilla family gang member, we don't want him out of prison. And so for five or six years, I was supposed to be out in 2012. I'm still sitting in solitary confinement trying to figure out why I'm still in prison. And so I had my family contact Stanford University in, I think, 2015. And they took my case. My, this is my three strikes case. They took my three strikes case. And they were, you know, litigating my three strikes case. And then when the federal stuff happened for solitary confinement, that's who I contacted. And I said, hey, like, should I be meeting the attorney general um, on my own? And they were like, absolutely not. <laughs> they, they said, we'll, we'll come down and, and put in a, a, a change of counsel form for you. And uh, we'll bring some friends of ours. And they brought... Mayor Brown, which is one of the biggest corporate firms in America, um, and to talk to me and they, they, you know, they, they thought my case was extremely unjust. And they basically told me, they said, Ken, don't worry about anything. He said, we're going to bring the federal court to its knees and we're going to tell them we're going to go all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States on what they did to you. And, and we mean that. And they, and they did just that. It took one meeting with them wow. and they took, they took like nine or 10 attorneys up in there. And Connections took, are important is what you're saying. Oh, 100 percent. It's part of the reason why, to be honest with you, um, I do the work I do, because I recognize, right. A, that I'm extremely privileged, extremely blessed. And I know that I got 99.9 .9 percent of people in the joint that look like me that will never have an opportunity to have Stanford University represent them. They'll never have an opportunity to have Mayor Brown represent them, either right. criminally or any other kind of way. And I know that if I turn my back and go on my way and live my life, which I can do, then I won't be able to sleep at night. And I, and I tell people, and I mean it, like, I don't, I don't want to compare myself to our ancestors because, you know, they went through a different type of atrocity, but I feel like the work I do, I'm doing is, is, is inspired by Harriet Tubman. I, I feel like if I'm free, that's cool, but like I'm leaving a whole bunch of people behind and I feel like I owe it to them to go back and kick in the doors of opportunity for them to get a shake. So what year did you get out completely out of uh, the institution? June 3rd, 2019. And I'd love to share with you just how that happened. So I kind of lost a little faith in getting out. The DA was still dragging their heels after I won my settlement. And they were kind of like, okay, should we let him out? The validation has been overturned. He's been exonerated. The state settled the case. And I walk out to the yard on maybe May 30th, May 29th, and the phones are all outside. And so I go get on the phone, I, I call my attorney at Stanford, and I'm like, hey, they have this new law that just came out, Jerry Brown signed in a law called Prop 57. And I said, I wanna pursue trying to get out on the Prop 57. And he, he told me, Ken, I'm not, he said, I'm not even paying attention to Prop 57. I said, why not? I got kind of indignant, right? <laughs> now, mind you, I think I'm a lawyer at this point. Right, so right. I, 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 he says, Ken, I got something else for you. And I said, well, what's up? He said, well, are you sitting down? And I said, no, I'm not sitting down. I'm standing up on the yard, man. What kind of question are you asking me, right? Right, right. He said, he said, well, listen. He said, we talked to the DA, and they're finally, they're finally going to lay down. He said, you'll be home by Friday. Wow. Now, at this time, you I weren't done, expecting that at all. I did almost 24 years, and you know that that I can't even put into words what it's like to be living the existence of like a trapped animal for 24 right. years and it, it wears on you, you know, and, and it does something to you. And, you know, when he told me that, I said, man, don't, don't play with me, man. He said, no, seriously, you'll be home by Friday. He said, there's a couple of things. We got to send some paperwork up to CDCR. He said, take two days to get it done. He said, you'll be home by the end of the week. And I, I remember hanging up the phone and a lot of my friends and homies were looking at me and they were like, Ken, what's going on? I'm like, nothing. And then, you know, the tears just came. You know, I, it was, it was, it was probably the most liberating news or five minutes I'd ever had in my life. It was like, it was like I'd been suffocating and then all of a sudden somebody gave me some oxygen. So that's, that's kind of how it happened. That's amazing. And so I walked out. 
in the span of three to four years, you went from being inside an institution for a good portion of that time in solitary confinement for reading a book to now being the lead, the head of the Checker Foundation. Talk to me a little bit about what you do as, uh, as the executive director of the Checker Foundation and vice president of checker.org. Sure. Well, primarily my work focuses on creating fair chance opportunities for men and women that are just as impacted, not only in California, but across the country. Um, but, it, but it probably would make sense for me to re hit rewind just a little bit and talk about what happened when I got out and how, how I got here. Um, yeah. Because, because that's, you know, I didn't expect to be here. I thought when I got out of prison that I was just going to go to school, get my paralegal certification and kind of like tuck my head and go try to get a job making. Keep doing the legal thing. Doing the legal thing. I, I found a knack for it. I was good at it. And I was in my mind like, okay, if I can go find a job for $70,000, $75,000 a year, I'll be cool, right? Right. And what I found when I got out here was this whole like nonprofit justice reform movement that was happening not only in the Bay Area, but in LA. I'd never heard of it before. And, and I got connected to a job two weeks out of prison where they hired me as a paralegal at a public interest law firm here in Oakland, California. And... I did that and the organization was really about criminal justice reform. They were into a lot of different criminal justice reform um, measures and initiatives in Sacramento. And I remember the, the executive director, you know, his name was Dorsey Nunn, OG in the game, you know, really started the criminal justice reform movement in California 40 years ago. He came to me and he said, you know, Ken, we knew that you could write legal briefs because, you know, that's why we hired you as a paralegal, but we didn't know you could talk the way you do. And so we're gonna kind of send you to Sacramento to be the policy director. So they made me state policy director. That's how I met Jamelia. Um, and so- And how long I, after you got released was that? Six months. Six months. Well, actually about four to, four to five months is, was when I first got offered the job and then I settled in right around six months. So six months out, I'm a policy director. I don't know anything about policy, but I know how to go out there and make a case, right? And so I, I, I really was surrounded by a lot of great organizations and great people in California that taught me the game. And I did a lot of listening. And I just took what I knew and what was natural in me, which was, was to fight and to, to advocate and, and took that show on the road to Sacramento and was involved with uh, on the forefront of reinstalling voting rights for people who had got out of prison um, on parole, ACA 6. Um, was on the front end of a lot of uh, fines and fees, criminal justice sentencing reform, et cetera. And from that experience, I built a lot of relationships in Sacramento with legislators and built a lot of relationships with nonprofit organizations up and down the state and advocates, people who had been formerly incarcerated and that were fighting for changes in the law, for civil rights laws. And then um, after a year of that, fast forward to May, June, 2020, a friend of mine got out and had a nonprofit and had a, a substantial amount of money to fund the nonprofit and asked me would I come lead some work. And I told him I'd spent a lot of time up and down the state as a policy director talking about ban the box, which is how I kind of got learned. The organization I work for, Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, they kind of were the uh, torchbearers for ban the box. They had passed ban the box in California and, and all across the country. And so I had the opportunity and privilege to go talk to companies about why they needed to hire formerly incarcerated people and give them jobs. I had an opportunity to talk about the value proposition that we have. And the fact that we have a unique experience and that we have a unique perspective that can add value to your company. Now, these companies that I'm talking to are tech companies. I'm talking to Google. I'm talking to Fitbit. I'm talking to Salesforce. I'm talking to all the, the big hitters in Silicon Valley. And most of them were, and they were intrigued by the idea that here, here comes this cat, me up in there saying that they should hire people fresh out of the joint. And so they were kind of entertained and amused. And they would ask me like, well, Ken, what kind of skill sets do these folks have that you're talking about? And I said, shit, my, none of my homies have ever seen a smartphone. They've never been on a Zoom call, don't know how to Google Drive, they don't know how to any of that. And they were like, yeah, you know, that's 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 kind of too bad because like we don't we don't have the capacity to teach things that they're teaching like in junior high school now. Right. Okay. What you might want to think about, Ken, is think about a, a skill building program that can kind of get people skilled up and then we kind of we we consider it. And so they were sincere when they told me that. So I said, okay, let me let me go back and think about how I would do that. And I said, I'm going to design the Stanford of reentry programs. And what that's going to look like is I'm going to advocate for people to have their own housing, their own room, 
their own bathroom. I'm going to provide an optimal learning environment. I'm going to pay them a stipend because I know everybody needs that immediate influx of cash when they get out. And, and, and when we don't have that cash, it forces us into those low wage jobs that we can't get out of, right? I'm going to teach them digital literacy, financial literacy, and then I'm going to take them through boot camps, six to nine month boot camps where I'm teaching them how to do tech skills. And I, and I, and I put together a business plan for it. And uh, I went after I became executive director of this new organization, I went and started using my relationships at the California legislature and talking to the governor's office about how to reimagine reentry, how to, rather than start off thinking people deserve to be treated like they're still in prison when they get out of prison, which is what happens in reentry. I want to treat everybody like they serve their time and that I believe the best in them. I'm going to lift them up. I'm going to tell them how great they are. I'm going to believe in them. I'm going to believe that they can have co-ed facilities with reentry. I'm going to tell them that I know that they can walk into Google and perform. I'm going to tell them all the things they were never told when they were kids. Because I, I've watched grown men have shattered sense of self in prison. Killers, gang members, who when you ask them about something that happened to them when they five, they break down in tears like a baby. Mm -hmm. And I knew that many of us were broken before we got to prison. Right. And that we what we needed to do was blow the lid off of low expectation. We needed to blow the lid off of low self-esteem, which causes us to self-destruct. That's, that's what causes us to do self-destructive stuff when we don't care about ourselves. We don't see any value in ourselves. And I, and I know that if you show men and women value in themselves, they're capable of amazing things. I've witnessed it. I'm a testament to it. And I've seen it in thousands of others. Right. So I did that. And then, you know, I, I had a Hail Mary. I've always been kind of a, a, a swinger of a big bat. And I just started talking to legislators about, give me $28 million <laughs> to build out this program that I've imagined. And they, you know, they pretty much most of them thought I was crazy. They were like, Ken, you, right. you've, never, you've never run an organization. The organization that you build is brand new. You have no track record. You're two years out of prison. I was two years out of prison and I'm asking the governor and all the legislators to give me $28 million to build out a new reentry system. And, and I'll never forget, it may have been late June, 2021. I got a call from um, a budget analyst in Sacramento and, and she said, Ken, you know, you've done everything we've asked you to do. Cause they asked me to go get signed contracts with Google, which I did. They asked me to go get contracts with UC Berkeley, Goldman School of Policy to evaluate the program, which I did. They asked me to go get all these things. I did every single thing that they asked me. And, they, and she told me on a Friday afternoon, I'll never forget it. She said, Ken, you cannot repeat this to anybody. I said, okay. She said, they're gonna give it to you. I said, they're gonna give me what? She said, they're gonna give you everything you asked for. And I said, you got to be joking. Hmm. So now I think be... ultimately you ended up passing on all that, right? <laughs> well, no, no, no. I, I, I got all that. We, we, we got the money and uh, the organization that um, I was executive director of, you know, they're still, they have a reentry home here, a campus in Oakland, California. They're doing big things. Great, great group of work. But shortly after that, this is where kind of the, tra the checker transition happened. Right. About two months after we got the, the budget award, I get a phone call from somebody who worked at Checker and they like, you know, Ken, we've been kind of watching you and, you know, this and that. And uh, we're opening up a, a foundation, a corporate foundation, and we need somebody to operationalize fair chance hiring as our social impact program. And so I'm like, eh, I'm not really interested because I just got $30 million from the state. Right. Right. Like, I'm set, right? I'm, I'm ready to like take over the world with this stuff and, and create a new model for people. And then, you know, they said, well, hey, just can you come talk to us and, and give us some thought leadership and, you know, tell us if we're doing things the right way. And, and, and I did and they kind of cornered me off. And when they cornered me off for a private conversation, they started talking tech money and they started talking about the diff a different stage um, that I could be on to do to advance this work. And, you know, I tell people when they ask me, like, why did I leave? I said, well, you know, not the nonprofit world is kind of like high school football, good high school football. Right. Everybody likes to go to a good game on a Friday night eat a hot dog, yell with the local kids. But when when Silicon Valley calls, that's like the NFL. Right. That's a whole different stage. And like, I, I would have been irresponsible as a person two years out of prison to turn down the opportunity to, to go be a VP, a vice president at a, at a tech company and nationalize the work of fair chance hiring with companies all across America. 
So it's, and, it's that, and now you'll sit in corporate offices and do this, right? So that's what I do. Leaders I mean, I, I, of these corporations, right? That's what I do. I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm so privileged and blessed to be able to go to talk to companies all across the country. I've taught, I've, I've taught fair chance hiring to some of the biggest companies in America, General Motors, Coke Industries, The Gap, Expensify, like you name it. I've, I've, I've been at uh, Cisco, right? Union Pacific Railroads. Like I've taught executives at some of the biggest companies in America on why they need to embrace fair chance hiring and give people who are coming out of prison, who are trying to rebuild their lives, trying to reset livable wage employment. Because I, here's what I've witnessed that people don't recognize. You can take the person that you think should be locked up in prison forever in 90% of the cases. You give that person a job for $75,000 a year, and I'm going to tell you what happens. And I can give you 100 examples today. They're going to be the first one to sign up to teach their kids Little League. They're going to be in the house before it gets dark. They're the first ones to get up early in the morning to go to work. They do double and triple overtime. They do all the things because now they have a reason. Their dignity has been installed. They're not going to afford to do the things that they couldn't afford to do that got them in trouble in the first place. I've witnessed transformation from people that the system said, throw them away. And I let, promise let me, let me ask you a question on that because uh, it seems to me uh, that some people uh, in their mind, and, and you kind of touched on this earlier, somebody that's in the system, been locked up for years, somebody similar to your experiences, yep. they believe it. They they believe that they're not worth it. Um, they not even just the institution, but even before they got to the institution, there was probably forces, systemic type of things that told them that they can't have those kind of jobs you were just talking about. They can't that's do right. those. So that's for somebody else. So before I get to a couple of the other questions I have, how, how do you how how have you addressed that? Um, because if I if I can't see myself in that job, then maybe I never even put my foot forward for that. So, well, it is ironic and crazy as it may sound. I really typically don't have to say much because I'm living it. So because so, you've gone through it, it builds credibility with the people you're talking to. I go into prisons all across the country. And when I go into prisons, I've had women. I've went into many women's prisons, many men's prisons, and seen all of them when I go up there and share with them what I just shared with you today. They break down in tears. They say, you were the first person ever that I saw myself in. And it gives me hope and reason now. I'm, I'm going to go to a group. I'm going to go to a program. I'm going to go learn as much as I can possibly learn. I'm going to go read a book. Because now they see the possibility. They see the light at the end of that dark tunnel. It's now a possibility when, as you alluded to just a minute ago, it wasn't a possibility. They grew up in South Central. They grew up in Oak Park. They grew up in East Oakland. They grew up in Hunter's Point. They grew up in all these places where they didn't understand anybody that worked in tech. They'd never seen it. They'd never seen anybody that had a $100,000 a year job. They'd never seen anybody that was able to do a lot of the things that I'm able to do, right? And so what I do is I let everybody know, like, you have a tremendous value and you're gifted. I believe every single human being at different levels, of course, is gifted and has a value proposition. And so if you just believe in yourself and you don't believe that you need to be in an orange vest picking up shit on the side of the freeway, if you don't believe that whatever society has told you your limitation is and you achieve higher than that or you see greater than that, you can do whatever you want to do. And I teach what, that every single day. What, what you just described to me sounds like, um, to me, what I try to uh, kind of talk to people about. And, you know, you walk into a room with a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctorate, and people give you uh, you know, some sort of respect and all those sort of things. And to me, what you just described is your personal experience outside of any formal education you've received is also similar to a degree. And if as a society, we value that because somebody that didn't walk into those rooms with the experiences you had, those other folks might not probably wouldn't have listened, right? Like you don't understand my circumstances. Like you it haven't, have. but because you walked in with that degree, if you will, it got them to be able to see something different in their own mind, which to me seems like that's the first step, right? Yeah, I, I have to be able to see it before 100%. I can take advantage of it. 100%. And, and I'll say this. I, I don't say this as a feather in my cap. I say it as a way to explain to my constituents and people out there. I have a ninth grade education. So that's the honest to God truth. I never went to school past the ninth grade. You have degrees in life, though. I got degrees in life. And everything I got was because... I was determined, I was resilient. I refused to accept 
the belief that somebody else had in me. I, I read in prison, I read over a thousand books. That's no exaggeration. Not because I was smart. I wasn't smart. I was determined to keep my mind free. I was determined to tell that person. I don't, and I, I don't want to get derogatory, but I, to tell that person who knew me for 10 minutes, that judge in that case who threw my life away and said, you will not have a chance to get out of prison until the year 2048. I would have been 82 years old. The average life expectancy of the black man in America is 72 years old. They told me in 10 minutes they wanted me to die in prison. I rebuke that. I resist that. My life is more valuable than that. But this person who didn't know me, probably 30 days after the fact, couldn't recite my name or recognize my face, threw my life away in an instant. Now, I'm, that's not to say I haven't done things in my life that, that I shouldn't have done. Absolutely. Sure. But that whatever I've done does not equal to a, lib a functioning death sentence. Whatever I've done does not equate to me having a valueless life. Nor were the the, ram the system's ramifications for what you did, did those specific things stand a good chance of changing you to where, had you got out, you would have stopped doing those sort of things, which is some of my challenges with us as a system. Like, what are we doing to change the root causes? Which brings me to my next question. Uh, as somebody also similar to yourself that is, um, I would even say fascinated with history. And I haven't always been uh, somebody that values history, but as an adult in researching history, it started to explain so many things, so many things that I did not understand before that. And it seems to me like we go on these cycles, right? We get tough on crime because crime is going up. We implement things like, as you mentioned earlier, three strikes and zero tolerance and law enforcement agencies like mine that I worked in and led go into neighborhoods with zero tolerance. We sw swoop in, arrest everything that moves, and then we leave. Um, that was very successful for decades in terms of reducing crime. Crime dropped precipitously for decades. Um, yep. But then we get comfortable. We feel safe. Then we start trying to do criminal justice reform, let people out of prison, all these things. And we get into this never-ending loop that we get comfortable. We start relaxing things, changing rules, let folks out, do all these different things. Crime starts going up. We get nervous again about our safety. Then we re-implement all these zero tolerance. We're kind of in that loop right now where you see cities now, San Francisco and other cities that were on the other side of changing rules and lessening law enforcement, now calling for more law enforcement. I just watched a press conference in the African-American community in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago where they're at, the community members are calling for the National Guard come into their community because of these spikes and homicides and violent crime um, and make more arrests. Um, so what do you think we need to do as a society in general, not just the criminal justice, but a society as a whole to maybe uh, get out of this never ending loop, like the self-fulfilling prophecy that we keep going in and returning to and, and yet our impoverished communities stay impoverished or become more impoverished, keep kicking out more and more people that get arrested and and go to prison, as opposed to addressing those root causes. What what do you think in your experience and the work that you do now are some of the like the the key things that we should be thinking about as not just as a criminal justice system, but as society? Yeah. No, that's that's it's a great point. I think you hit on it. You you talked about impoverished folks. And I think that. When you look at what's happening in society, whether it's substance abuse, violence, theft, drug use, by you know homicides, robberies, et cetera, they, they all have one thing in common. And, and they're all birthed and grown from the seeds of poverty. And so when you when you look at communities that feel like that they don't have access, have systemically been caged in to a lack of access to the middle-class economy, to economic mobility, then what you have is a, is a bunch of people around the country that are going to continue to reach for the candy that they're forced to live around on a regular basis and don't have access to. America is like a candy store. You, you, can, you can buy Maybox and Mercedes Benz and fly across to, to amusement parks and, and jet set and hip hop concerts and all the other kind of stuff. And yet you're telling people you can't afford to, to have it or live it or, or 
buy a home or to buy a car, to be able to take care of your children and buy clothes and buy the things that America says makes you valuable. You can't go to Black Friday and spend 2000 after Thanksgiving on stuff that's on sale. You can't do any of those things, right? And so the number one driver being poverty, we have to do a better job at giving people access, meaningful access to livable wage employment and access to economic mobility. If we do that, and I, and I, I share this with you, part of the reason I'm passionate about this work is I've watched people who grew up in the projects, spent most of their life incarcerated, in poverty. Soon as you took that person out and put them in an environment where they could make a livable wage, right? All of a sudden their entire trajectory, their entire sense of self, the, everything they feel about being a man with their family and providing and paying bills and buying their son a pair of Jordans at the local swap meet, it changes an entire person's trajectory. We've seen it over and over and over again, right? So I think as a society, you know, it's 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 unfortunate and it's sad that, you know, 1% of the people run 55, 60% of the wealth in this country. And I think that if you don't want some of these society problems, we need to do a better job at spreading the equity. And the equity doesn't mean giving people handouts. Right. The equity means empowering people to be able to have access to what we call the middle-class economy in this country. And, and when we do that, and we provide people space to be able to do that. I've seen wonderful results happen in history, not just in my lifetime, but in history. History demonstrates that when you give people access to opportunity, meaningful opportunity, and you give them access, access to take advantage of that, they do that. I don't care where they come from. I love that you say that because all too often, I think we think the solution is law enforcement. And, and I don't mean enforcement necessarily, but reform law enforcement. And that's sure. not to say that police departments and law enforcement don't need some attention, right? And don't need to change some things and some beliefs and culture and all those sort of things. That That's all true too. But what you just described, a lot of what you just said is outside of law enforcement. Right? And, and I always say that, you know, for some reason, when all hell breaks loose, our sole solution is law enforcement every time, even amongst the people that claim to be reformers and all that. The fallback is always law enforcement. I'm like, as long as that's the case, we're never going to solve the root causes. So the line will continue to replenish itself. And we might save one person at a time, but the line continues to get longer. We got to cut the line. We got to stop people from being fed into the system. Well, it's, reactionary, it's reactionary politics, isn't it? It's, it's, yes, absolutely. Poly class happens and we spend a yes. trillion dollars over 25 years locking people up for stealing a loaf of bread right? And then we realize like, oh, we made a mistake. We can't really afford that. We're locking too many people up for life in prison. The prison system is over exploding. And so then they change, reverse, re, revert course. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking like, who's making these policies where every right. 10 or 15 years, right. you're, you're, you're like realizing you made a mistake because you reacted in an emotional way. That's not to say that wasn't a tragedy. Of course it was a tragedy, right? right? Absolutely. It was a tragedy. Like my, my chest goes out to every single victim of every crime that's ever happened. I don't care if it's breaking in a car, but the, 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 solution for that is to understand the root causes of what causes people to create that behavior in the first place. And oftentimes it comes from, again, poverty, broken homes, societal ills, society has failed to uphold these young brothers and these, these young Latino cats and these young sisters from being in the streets. They don't, they don't see a way outside of uh, Oak Park. That's all they see. Right. Like you said, you said it earlier at the top of the show, they don't see Silicon Valley for them. It's not even an option. What they see on TV is a fantasy. What they see is the neighborhood outside, the gunshots in the trees and in the park and the gang members and all. That's what they see. They see their mama coming home and picking up a crack pipe or drinking because she's in pain and whatever. And she's poor, uh, mouth to hand and all the rest of that kind of stuff. So society has to do a better job of providing people opportunity and understand that it's, it's, it's not a good versus bad. It never has been. But we, we do that job of othering. We do that job of like yeah, pitting police departments and treating them like they're the military and then saying, oh, these people over here are bad. Let's go in and use the force we would in a war right. against a community. They do the same thing in prison. How do right. we load them up with all kinds of bulletproof vests and everything else? I mean, we, we eating off half of toothbrushes right. in prison. You, 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 you in so much gear, you ready to go to Iraq. Well, and that brings me to one of my last questions. You know, a couple of years ago, we had this really horrific um, murder in one of the original neighborhoods of Sacramento, one of the wealthiest uh, um, 
neighborhoods in Sacramento where this elderly, beloved elderly woman in the neighborhood was murdered, uh, uh, assaulted, murdered, her dog was murdered, attempted to burn her house down. Um, and the person that did it uh, was what we call a parolee at large, right? He was wanted, he'd, he'd been in and out of prison, uh, I think most of his life. He was wanted at the time for a parole violation or some new charge. And as I'm sure you could imagine and can imagine, you know, his fam, her family, the neighborhood, um, they were, they were uh, horrified and scared. They're scared for their safety. Um, and I'm sure there was people, and we had numerous community meetings over this where people, you know, let their frustrations out. They felt like the system had let them down. Um, that why was this person out? Uh, why was he able to do this to one of the beloved neighbors? And so I'm sure there are some people that also felt, not that they said it at any of the community meetings, that like, you should never let these guys out. Sure. Like, these are animals. These are monsters. Like, keep them in because this is what happens when you let them out. Sure. So somebody with your experience and especially the work that you do now, like, what is your response to that? Because as you know, I'm I'm sure in your work, you run into it all the time. There are people that something horrific like that doesn't even need to happen. They're like, you steal a pack of gum from the 7-Eleven, you should be locked up for 30 years. I've heard those folks too. So, so what, what would you say to those people? Because, you know, as they do polls, whether they political polls or whatever, safety is always at the top of people's concerns or desires or what they want is safety. And so something like that shatters their sense of safety. What, what, what would you say to people that have that feeling like you commit a crime, you, you should you should be in there, you should be busting up rocks and doing hard labor for the next the rest well, of your life? Yeah, I, first of all, I empathize with anybody who, who suffered a loss and, and gone through anything. So what I try to do is, is put myself in their shoes and meet them where they're at and empathize with them. And, you know, when people go really, really super on like emotional tangents, I recognize that for what it is, as far as, you know, coming from a reactionary hurtful place. At the same time, like it's it's the citizenry of America, it's the citizenry of California that's invested and pays tax dollars in a system, right? Whether we agree with it or don't agree with it, we have the opportunity in California to change it through proposition. We can basically like write any law that we want to in California. And yet the 20, 30 million people in California, we've elected to invest in this system of, of criminal justice, you know, um, justice. And in that, We've invested in a system where 95% of people are going to come home. That That's a fact, right? No matter what. It's been like that for a while. No matter what. And so the reality is, is that, you know, I get it. Like something happens to us. We, we, we feel viscerally about it. And we should. I don't minimize that. But on the other side of that, there's also the piece that since 95% of people are coming home, even people who committed murder, Right. The question we need to ask ourselves as a society is what type of folks do we want coming home right. that are our neighbors? Because what will happen is, is if you continue to exclude people, this is throughout history. When you treat people poorly and you marginalize people and you exclude people, history has told us that that doesn't breed a proper result. Right. There's usually a lot of bad that comes from that. On the flip side of that, when you embrace people, when you love people, when you lift them and you actually believe in them, imagine that all of a sudden good results grow from that. So for people who get out of prison, who haven't transformed, they get out, they're exiled, they can't get a job, they're homeless, they do, all those things, that creates a lot of different negative stuff in folks. It causes a lot of mental illness. It causes a whole lot of things. And that's part of the society that we created. On the other side of it, what I try to tell people is, listen, we live in a capitalist economy. Great. Let's say I agree with you. They should never get a job. They don't deserve anything. Okay, great. Are you going to invest social service dollars and tax dollars to put the build a community out in wherever and give them housing and pay for their food, pay for their clothing, pay for the policing of those neighborhoods? If you're willing to do that, then that's another conversation. But if you're not willing to do that, I haven't heard an argument yet. And I've been on some of the top universities in America, given these kind of conversations. I haven't heard an intellectual intellectual argument yet that says, what do you want folks to do? If you're not going to employ them, if you don't want them to live around you, you don't want to house them, you don't want to provide opportunity, you don't want them to be your neighbor, 
what is it that you want somebody who just did 20 years in prison to do? Right. And I haven't heard anybody come up with an argument yet. Now, unless we're prepared as a society to invest trillions of dollars in investing in the 80 million people in America that have a criminal record in this country, like what we need to do is the right thing and say, okay, hey, like they pay their time. That's the system we invested in. You pay your time, it's supposed to be over with the day they walk out of prison or get off parole or supervision or whatever. At that point, we have to allow people to reset and rebuild. When you don't do that, there's a lot of outgrowth from that. You see that in Oakland and San Francisco with the homeless population. 70% of the people that are homeless out here in these camp cities are just as impacted folks. That, that, and then people complain about the unhousing. Okay, well, what are we doing about the housing? What are we providing people? Are we providing people the opportunity to work and make a livable wage? Or are we doing Project Home Key where we're just building a whole bunch of hotels and re, re, rebuilding projects, which is what happened in the 60s and 70s? Well, I think that's part of what I always had an issue with is that you know, there's a whole lot of people that want to let people out of prison that believe in police reform, criminal justice reform. But for some reason, they they don't advocate for for investing in reentry and building skills so they can survive on their own. And I know this was never, as far as I know, written down, but I became a police officer in the late 80s. Um, and this wasn't written down, but like basically what we were taught was, look, these folks are committing crimes. Our job is to arrest them. Then they go to prison. And when they get out, they're going to commit crimes again. Our job is to arrest them and put them back in prison. And for the longest time, that, you know, kind of makes sense to you, right? You're a police officer. You got cuffs, you got, you know, gun, you got the law on your side. But at some point I realized, you know, if they, if our job is really to improve the quality of life or help improve the quality of life in our communities, then when they commit another crime, there's another victim associated with that. That's not improving the quality of life. We got to start thinking about how do, they, how do we set up a system to where they won't commit another crime because of all the things you said. And so, which is why I love what you developed even before you went to Checker, because it's part of how do I not just hand out, but how do I build this person's skills so they can earn it on their own, which not as, which is not just financial, but it's to build their self-esteem and build all those sort of things that are a lot longer lasting than just, you know, a couple hundred dollar paycheck. And so I really want to thank you for uh, being on the show. I think uh, your experiences and what you've talked about will help people that listen to this. But I want to end on this. Uh, if somebody listens to this and is inspired not only by your story, but the work that you're doing now, and also realizes that, as you said, 95% of the people that are inside an institution are at some point in their life going to come out. Um, and they believe like we should do something with that to ensure safety, their safety, our community safety. How could somebody help in this, both with Checker, what you're doing with Checker, but just in the effort in general of how do we build people that are able to be self-sustaining, have good self-esteem and see themselves as productive members. So therefore they will be productive members of society. How could somebody help with that? Is there websites or places they can go to volunteer or donate or, or whatever you think the general community that might be listening to you talk today could help? Sure. I, I think my first invitation to, to everybody is just to take a, a real deep look in the mirror and check their their bias towards people who have committed crimes. We, we've done a great job in this country of, of othering all types of people. It started with the indigenous population, Native Americans, and we othered African-Americans who were brought over here on slave ships. And then we spent time othering Mexican population. Then we othered the Middle Eastern population when things happened. We, we othered the Asian population. So we've done a real good job of saying like, those are those people over there and we're over here, right? And so the first thing I ask people to do is check that bias and recognize that we're all human and people have made mistakes. And once a person has made a mistake and a poor choice, which is what most of us have done who've been in the system, we deserve the right to move on from that mistake like anybody else, right? Uh, other people may have done things of lesser degree, but they still got a chance to move on. Every single person in America, for the most part, has told a lie in their life, but probably stole something one time in their life or done something they regret. 
and they get a chance to move on. And, you know, I think that every single person deserves a right to move on. So that's the first thing I would say. I think that, and become a contributing member to society, let's add that. I think that the other piece is, is if people were interested in providing space and opportunity for business owners, I would say contact me at ken.oliver at checker.com. Uh, we teach companies for free all across the country, all up and down California on how to become a fair chance employer, how to provide space and opportunity for men and women that are impacted by the justice system. We provide reskilling programs, apprenticeship programs. We go in and talk to business owners from all sides of the equation. We teach risk management, change management, who you should partner with in the nonprofit community, the whole nine. And, and my only ask is that every business hire one individual. Because you know what happens when they hire one individual at livable wage? They fall in love. And when they fall in love, you see, they say, you know what? That person is the best worker I ever had. They show up first. They're the most loyal. They're the most honest. They work the hardest. I need five more people like that. Every single instance, that's, that's what happens. I've never had one person say, oh, I don't want a person like that anymore. Right. right. Because people are so glad that for the first time in their life, somebody embraced them. Somebody accepted them. Somebody said, you're worthy. I see your value. Do you know what that does to a person who's who's lived a life of marginalization all their life? At Checker, we haven't had one single person quit in eight years of fair chance hiring. There's 60 people in Checker from lifers all the way down to people who've done five or six years. Not one person has ever left. You know why? Because people, people are amazed that a, a tech company with 1,500 employees is embracing them as somebody who came out of East Oakland or South Central LA or Watts or wherever, that man, it, it's like a lap dog. You can't get rid of them if you wanted to. They, they, they're they there every day. They work hard. They, they want to fetch everything for you. They do it all. People are loyal. People are loyal because somebody gave them a shot. Right, right. So, you know, from as far as volunteering, there's a lot of organizations up and down the state in Northern California. Sacramento has a lot of great organizations. LA has a lot of great organizations. Reach out, you know, on, on Google. You can Google criminal justice reform organizations. There's a lot of people doing great work in this state. California is on the forefront of doing great work. Um, we're seeing a little bit of blowback from Prop 47 and stuff like that, but right. a lot of great work has happened in the last decade in, in California to move the needle, and it's showing in the results. There's so many people who did life in prison who were leading charges all across the state, doing great work in corporate America and policy work and regular jobs, uh, blue collar jobs. So give people a shot, don't judge them, right? And that doesn't mean be blind. Every single person is not ready. There's going to right. be some people like, 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 the, like the cat that got out and, and did some right. poly class, right? Who are bent on that. And that's not the population I'm talking about. What I'm saying to your, to your audience is, is that a great majority, 70, 80% of people who are black and brown, who come from poverty, right. who come from these communities, aren't the Jeffrey Dahmers, right. aren't the people doing crazy stuff. These are people that like did robbery so they can go buy a car did something so they can go impress a girl or buy some sneakers or do some other kind of stuff because they didn't have means to do it and they didn't see another way, right? right. You get right. some clout in the neighborhood because you have a dope sack and somebody's going to look at you and think that you're the man. That's, that's self-esteem issues. That's ego issues. Those material items that you think make you up as a man, those are all esteem issues that we all suffered from when we were young because that's the message that we were given as black men that we ain't nothing unless we have those things. Hip hop tells us that every single day, right? So, you know, my, my biggest thing is just grace. And, and, and give people opportunity if people want to volunteer like i said there's a lot of organizations and they can always reach out to me i'll point them in any direction i help people 24 hours a day middle of the night morning they know somebody who's just as impacted they want to get a job skilling program help reach out yeah i think that's a great start for people that hear this and and realize that uh we we've got to do some work if we want to uh, maintain that safety that uh we all want i mean I think that's universal in all human beings. They want their family to be safe. They want to be safe. And I appreciate what you do, especially now where you see homelessness, homelessness rising, you see theft rising, you see every night on the news, you turn it on, there's groups rolling into Nordstrom's or whatever. And so it builds this sense of uh, a lack of safety. And then, you know, a lot of times we'll tend to like, well, let's just lock some folks up. So I, I appreciate um, all that you do and the fact that you took the time out to come on here because, you know, there's a lot of people that didn't grow up in impoverished neighborhoods. And there's a lot of people that haven't had the experience of being incarcerated, whether they're at a youth facility, a jail, a prison, and good for them. That's great. 
Uh, but it doesn't eliminate the fact that we need to understand from other people's experience if we want society to work for all people and which ultimately provides safety for all of us. So thank you, uh, Ken, for coming on. I appreciate your time. I appreciate all the work that you do. I appreciate your insight and uh, please keep doing it. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. And I look forward to building with you in the future. One of the big purposes of A Way Forward is to hear different voices and different opinions, because that is how we can make informed decisions ourselves. So if you are someone that would like to come on A Way Forward to express your opinion, go to chiefhan.com forward slash podcast. Chief, H-A-H-N dot com forward slash podcast.